Hi, welcome to this video on linear programming duality. We just finished discussing strong duality, and using strong and weak duality combined, we've been able to determine a pretty powerful relationship between a primal and dual linear program. Uh, in particular, strong duality told us that for a primal dual pair, if they both have feasible solutions, then they will both also have optimal solutions, and when you plug those optimal solutions into their respective linear programs, they will come out to be the same uh, optimal value. So uh, using those features of linear programs, we can now uh, do some new theoretical properties on the relationship between a primal dual pair. And uh, that will be the topic of this video, which is complementary slackness. So this video will be on the complementary slackness conditions. So let's take a look at what the statement of complementary slackness is actually stating. So first of all, what it's doing is it's providing a characterization for optimality of a primal dual pair of feasible solutions. So you give me a feasible pair of solutions, for the, both one for the primal, one for the dual, and then I will be able to tell you whether or not they are both optimal or not using uh, these complementary slackness conditions. So, um, so here's what this statement is. Okay, so let max and min be a primal dual pair of linear programs and let x bar and y bar be a primal dual pair of feasible solutions. So uh, then what we can conclude is that x bar and y bar are a primal dual optimal pair for max and min respectively, um, if and only if these following two conditions hold. So uh, one condition is for the x variables in the maximization problem and the second condition is uh, for the y variables in the minimization problem. Uh, both uh, conditions must hold though. Uh, okay, so what's the first condition saying? So for every variable xj of the maximization problem, that component of the feasible solution is zero, or the corresponding constraint in the minimization problem is tight. Uh, and so that goes for every single uh, index j. So uh, that component is zero, or the corresponding constraint is tight uh, in the minimization problem. Um, by the way, by tight, what we're saying is uh, tight just means holds with equality. So we might have an inequality constraint, but in fact, when you plug in the, uh, the feasible solution for the minimization problem there, which is y bar, when you plug that in for that constraint, it holds with equality. So let me just write that down. So tight uh, means holds uh, with equality. And, uh, okay, and so, uh, so for instance, let me just give you an example. So x less than or equal to 4, let's just assume we have a real valued variable here, x, and uh, less than or equal to 4 is the constraint, so a feasible solution is x bar equals 3. But for this feasible solution, the constraint is not tight because 3 is strictly less, uh, strictly less than 4 and not equal to it. Um, on the other hand, if x bar was instead 4, this would also be a feasible solution, and now the constraint would hold tight because uh, if 4 is exactly equal to 4. Um, so since, uh, since the inequality is in fact holding with equality, we would say that constraint is tight uh, for this feasible solution x bar. Okay, so that's what being tight means. Um, okay, so uh, that's, the, that's the first condition. Um, and then the second condition is entirely analogous, but it's just reversing the rules of everything. So he, for the first condition, it was the variables x and the maximization problem. Um, so now it's going to be for every variable yi of the minimization problem, uh, that feasible, uh, for the feasible solution we have, that component is zero, uh, or the corresponding constraint in the maximization problem is tight. So this has to apply for every single uh, component. Um, of, uh, of both the um, maximization and minimization uh, dual pair. Okay, um, so just, first of all, this is going to seem just a bit dense when you first encounter this statement. Uh, we're going to do an example just to see exactly what we're saying here. It'll become very clear very quickly what, uh, what this is actually saying. Um, there's more words than there are ideas here. Um, okay, just as a quick note of caution though before we go on, uh, the complementary slackness conditions are only testing whether the pair of solutions are optimal, not whether an individual solution is optimal. So we can only test both at the same time. Um, it's, it, for instance, we could have x bar being a primal, uh, a, an optimal solution to the maximization problem, and y bar not being optimal for the uh, minimization problem. So we'd still have one optimal solution there, but complementary slackness would not be able to detect that. All complementary slackness can do is detect whether both solutions are both optimal for their respective linear programs or not. If they're not both optimal, then it might as well be the case that neither of them are. Um, it, it, from the perspective of complementary slackness, we, we can't tell the difference. 
So, so we're just testing whether both are optimal simultaneously or not. So that's what, that's what complementary slackness is doing. So let's take a look at an example of uh, complementary slackness in order to uh, uh, illustrate what that statement was actually saying. So here we have a primal dual pair of linear programs, and in fact we've already seen this primal dual pair in previous videos, but that doesn't really matter. Um, the point here is that we have x bar and y bar, and they are in fact feasible solutions. As a matter of fact, we've already seen in previous videos that these are both optimal solutions for their respective linear programs, but let's just pretend we don't know that part right now. The thing that does matter is that they're both feasible, and we can determine that they're both optimal by using the complementary slackness conditions. So um, here I've, I've listed them out in this case, what they would be. So these are the uh, complementary slackness conditions. Um, okay, and then, uh, so what are they saying? So we're saying, um, well, for every constraint in, uh, in the maximization problem, either that constraint is tight when you plug in uh, the associated feasible solution, um, or the dual variable associated to that constraint is zero. Um, the dual variable being for the particular solution y bar that we have for the dual uh, solution. So, um, so we have three constraints here, uh, constraint one, two, and three, and associated to those constraints are the dual variables y, one, two, and three. So for the first constraint, we have y1, and y2, and then y3. Um, and so these are the dual variables. Um, and so, for instance, for this first constraint here, um, let's plug in x bar. So we'll have 1 times 5 uh, minus 3 times 2. So, so we have 5 minus 6 is minus 1, and then there's a 0 there for the last part. So we'll have minus 1 is greater than or equal to 2, but that does not hold tight because minus 1 is not equal to minus 2. It's strictly larger than, than minus 2. So, um, so that constraint does not hold tight. But on the other hand, what you can see uh, is that the dual variable there, which is y1, is zero. You can see here in this feasible solution for the dual, y1 is zero. So in this first constraint, um, what we, uh, sorry, condition I should say, for this first complementary slackness condition, we had that either one, two, one, those, uh, that constraint held with equality. So we had an inequality here. So either that holds with equality or, um, the uh, associated dual variable component was zero. And so this was not true here on the left. We, we saw that that was not true. The, the left-hand side equaled negative one, which was strictly larger than negative two. It wasn't equal to negative two. But on the right-hand side, that did hold true. Um, the y1 component was equal to zero. So we'll circle that to indicate that that's the part that held true. It could be, by the way, that both parts hold true, but at least one needs to hold true. Okay, and so now we just kind of go down the list here. So uh, for the next constraint, either when you plug in x bar, that constraint holds tight with equality, um, or the dual variable is zero. Uh, now we can see here that y bar for the second and third components, neither of those are zeros. So it better be the case that for both of these constraints, um, that when you plug x bar in, those constraints do hold with equality in order for this to be, uh, for these to be uh, optimal solutions. So, so let's plug x bar in. So we'll have uh, 4 times 5 minus 3 times 6, so we'll have 20 minus 18, and then there's a 0 for the last part. So uh, 20 minus 18 is 2, which is less than or equal to 2, but in fact it's exactly equal to 2. So this constraint here does hold uh, tight with equality. So uh, we can circle that constraint down below because that does hold true. I, I should say condition whenever I'm referring to this down here. These are the CS conditions. Um, okay, and then finally for the last one, well, there's nothing actually to check here because we already have an equality uh, for the constraint, and since this is a feasible solution, uh, then it, of course, is satisfying this constraint with equality. So this is just vacuously true. There's nothing to even check uh, for this last uh, statement here. It's just automatically true, so we can circle it. And, uh, and so the constraints, uh, for the primal constraints and uh, uh, y variables, we've... Uh, certify that those are true, but we're not done. All the constraints need to, to hold true. Um, so I just put this gap of space here just to, just so we can have some spatial visualization of these are the ones associated to the primal, these are the ones associated to the dual, but, but again, they all must hold true. So let's keep going. So 1, 4, 2 uh, times the dual feasible solution, um, so 0, 4, 2 here, either that holds it tight with equality or the corresponding um, primal uh, component here, x1, is a zero. But of course you can see that for the first and the second uh, components, neither of those are zeros, so it better be the case that for these uh, first two constraints, uh, those are zeros. Let me, by the way, just explicitly write, we have x1 is associated to the first constraint, 
x2 for the second, and x3 for the third. So these, uh, these variables here are associated to these constraints. So these variables are in the primal, these constraints are the dual. Okay, so let's plug in y bar now. So um, it better be the case that this holds tight, since uh, we know that x1 is not equal to 0, it's, it's 5. So, so, um, so 1 times 0 plus 4 times 4, so uh, uh, that's 16, and then minus 2 times 2 is 12. And so 12 is greater than or equal to 12, but in fact it's exactly equal to 12 so on the right-hand side here. So this first constraint of the uh, dual holds tight with equality, and so we can circle that constraint down below. So we'll circle that, because that does hold true. And uh, similar to the uh, thing that happened here on the left, um, you can see that this next constraint is an equality constraint, and this is a feasible solution here, so of course the constraint holds tight with equality, because we're starting with an equality constraint. So again, this is vacuously holding true, and so we can just automatically circle that constraint down below. So that condition is vacuously satisfied. And finally, we have this third constraint, um, uh, where we have to find out whether this holds tight or not. So 0 times 1 is 0, plus 5 times 4 is 20, uh, minus 3 times minus 2 is, is plus 6, well, 20 plus 6 is 26, which is uh, greater than or equal to 20, but it's strictly greater than 20. So it's not equal to 20, so this constraint does not hold tight. So it better be the case that the associated uh, variable to this constraint is 0, um, x3 is 0. And, ooh, okay, lucky for us, uh, x, x3 is, is 0. So um, that constraint, um, that condition down below does hold true because the uh, associated variable there is zero. Well, um, okay, so uh, there's nothing really to hold your breath about there. No surprises. We already knew that these were going to be optimal solutions, so of course this, these complementary slackness conditions were going to be satisfied. Um, but if, if we didn't know that these were optimal solutions, we would have just found out by uh, seeing that, that uh, the complementary slackness conditions were satisfied for this primal dual pair. So what we can conclude, so therefore, um, x bar and y bar form a primal uh, dual optimal pair. So we already knew they were feasible, but now they're optimal uh, as well. So optimal pair uh, of solutions uh, for their respective linear programs. So, um, so yeah, so, so we're able now to uh, detect whether or not this a pair of solutions for a primal dual pair of linear programs are optimal or not, and we can do so using the complementary slackness conditions. So in the next video, we will uh, see how to derive these conditions, where they come from. So if they come from strong duality, we'll, we'll see exactly how they do, and, uh, and then we'll see some useful applications of uh, the complementary slackness condition. But that'll be for future videos, so that's it for this video. Uh, so thank you for watching.